Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Well, here we go on um, lecture number two, but before I get started... I didn't really appreciate the 11 of you that came over and woke me up to tell me that Jerry did a lot better than I did. I, I didn't think that was too funny. But we've done a lot together, and I know what wonderful perspective he has. And uh, Thanks, Jerry, for agreeing to do that. Um, part of what um, I'm going to talk about in this section on the society that we all belong to is the fact that um, in order to really be a completely well-rounded, mature member of Alcoholics Anonymous on a spiritual path, you really should know a lot about our history. And um, my favorite historian is uh, Ernie Kurtz, and I'll talk about different books and stuff. And he said that without history, there's no hope, which is an interesting comment or observation. And I see what he's saying is that if you don't have a sense of our history and the course that we've followed through all these years, it can be confusing as to where we're going or what's happening and as a fellowship, as a society. And um, if you're not familiar, there's... Um, history books that are written by the fellowship itself. Um, A.A. Comes of Age, Dr. Bob of the Good Old Timers, and Pass It On. And recently they tried to come up with another history book that the fellowship put together, but nobody could agree on it. And it's going to become increasingly difficult for us as a society to agree on recent history. And uh, so I don't know if we'll see another book that is a history book that is put together by our fellowship. That's just a guess. So we have to rely on people outside the fellowship. And amongst them, there's... uh, about eight books that I think are really good. And, uh, Robert Thompson was our first historian. He just had a book, Bill W., based on interviews. And um, the advantage of um, outside history books is that if they see something that is, deserves some criticism, they're going to include it. Whereas when you write your own history, you leave that out. Just out of modesty or something. You just (laughs) don't want to include certain things. And so there's a a plus to both. And um, Bill spent a lot of time writing AA Comes of Age. And it followed a theme that he had, which I call a rush towards maturity. He just wanted somehow to have alcoholics, recovered alcoholics in Alcoholics Anonymous. When people think of us, he was hoping they would think immediately of very mature people. 
That's quite a Herculean task <laughs> for anyone. But I think he really was <laughs> obsessed with it because when you look at the themes for the General Service Conference for a number of years, it was coming of age, uh, we accept maturity, um, our responsibility, and, and all these things. And of course, if you uh, look in the 12 and 12, in step 12, there's that wonderful comment where he said a group of eminent psychologists was asked to look at us as a fellowship, and this is in the 50s, and give, the, give us their feedback. And their feedback was, according to the book, that we were childish, immature, and grandiose. Terrible blow. <laughs> Terrible blow. <laughs> and um, I think if someone came to a AA group business meeting, an outside observer, they might conclude that right away <laughs> as they watch the petty arguments going on. Um, and so, and Dr. Bob and the good old timers obviously focuses more on Dr. Bob. And um, they have the great photographs. And it gives you a sense of where you came from. Who put this stuff together that led to your sobriety? And pass it on is about Bill. And there's more emphasis about his work photographs, etc. And um, we're also blessed with a number of movies. The first one with James Garner and James Wood. And recently I saw the Bill W. movie that I thought was just wonderful. And uh, so these are all part of uh, the history that's available that as you move along in AA, it really is necessary, in my opinion, to be a good sponsor, to be a um, someone who is worth following. I don't want to say a leader, but someone who has got the complete roundedness to um, help set the tone in your home group and to um, have some wisdom that is based on familiarity with, with our history. Now my favorite, and I brought these two books along, is Ernie Kurtz. And he wrote, this, first, this was the first one, I'm, I'm preserving the dust jacket because this is the first printing. And it goes from the AA's origin up to shortly before Bill died. And Ernie was a student at Harvard and wanted to do a PhD on Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, they said, yeah, go ahead. So he went down to New York and asked if he could have access to all our files, and they gave it to him, which is amazing, <laughs> because he was able to see in there things that hadn't been reported in other history books, and he included them. This book is also by him, and it's called A.A. The Story, and it picks up where this book leaves off. So it goes from shortly before Bill's death to 1987. So since 1987, that's 25 years. Um, without this type of history, I don't know if Ernie's going to or is up to doing anything like this. Now, these are quite detailed. It's a PhD, so there's more footnotes almost than there are text. And as you get more familiar with this, you find the footnotes are more fascinating in some cases. He just dug out things that are um, 
quite remarkable. As the history sinks in, it serves as a navigational guide because you can just see here's the path <laughs> and it started here and we're here and you can see that if we follow the same principles it'll just continue on and it gives you a sense of um, being comfortable where we are so in order to get this thing started just to see how exciting we can make this talk I prepared a list of history questions that I'm going to ask you all and I was going to have it be a contest between this side of the room and this side of the room but we can see that all the smart people are on the same side of the room <laughs> so it, it wouldn't be fair to do that so we're just going to open it up to anybody that want to raise their hand just for the fun of it and if you get it wrong who cares some of them are very simple and others are so obscure I'm going to have to read the answer off the page. Okay, here we go. We need some volunteers. Our co-founders are William G. Wilson and Robert H. Smith. What does the G and H stand for? Bingo. Griffith. Right off the bat, a winner. Thank you. <laughs> Did you get that? Middle initial. Okay. Now we're going out to Akron. Reverend Walter Tunks was the minister Bill called from the church directory in the Mayflower <clears throat> that led to the meeting with Henrietta Cyberling and Dr. Bob. What other two roles did Reverend Tunks play in our history? Ah, it got a little harder. Nobody? Even Bob? Okay, he conducted Dr. Bob's funeral service. And his church was the one selected by Firestone to have the Oxford group come to Akron, which was a big deal. So he was very involved with the Oxford and AA and a great lover of uh, AA. All right. I don't think anybody will know this one. Lois's grandfather was a minister in a certain religion. Bill and Lois were married in a church of this religion. Oh, I see the hands going up. What religion was this? Swedenborgian. Everybody's heard of that, right? <laughs> Swedenborgianism. And if you're wondering what that is, we're going to fill you in a little bit. In the 1700s, in Sweden, a man named Swedenborgian was a regular guy. He had a job. He's about 52 or 53 years old. And God started talking to him. And he didn't really go and tell anybody. He just wrote down everything that he received over the next 15 years. And um, as he got older, he shared his notes with people he had no intention of doing anything with it. But after he died, people said, hey, we got, uh, we got a new religion here. This came from God. And uh, it had all kinds of uh, differences with Christianity. 
the second coming had already occurred and this was going to happen and uh, boy the religion took off and you know it came over here it went to a lot of different countries and it has there's still some of it left under a different name we found a church near Tampa and I forget what it is the new whatever okay what state were Bill and Bob from well the whole room knew that one what is AA's founding day birthday? All right, you got that. How about Dr. Bob had AA's first slip while doing what? Medical convention. <laughs> what was it? Drinking, yes. That's a better answer. I'm going to put that in here. <laughs> All right, you guys. <clears throat> Which of our co-founders had a giant tattoo, and what was it? Dr. Bob? Dragon? A large blue dragon that went around his whole left arm with red fire and a 16-point compass. And the rumors were that he got it while drunk at Dartmouth. <laughs> I had all those years in the Marine Corps drunk and I never got a tattoo. I just don't understand that. All right, let's go to Clarence Snyder. We're halfway through. <coughs> Why did Clarence Snyder disobey his sponsor, Dr. Bob, and leave the Akron-Oxford group meeting to commence a separate meeting in Cleveland, Ohio? Catholics, that's right. Everybody hear that? Clarence was uh, a champion 12-stepper, and he was rounding up guys from Cleveland, new alcoholics, and bringing them down to the meeting in Akron. And a heavy percentage of these guys were Catholic. And when they got sober, the priest wanted to know what happened. You know, Larry, what's going on? You look wonderful. Oh, I'm going to Oxford meetings in Akron. Well, you can't do that as a Catholic. Or we'll excommunicate you. So they were between the rock and the hard place. <clears throat> and the big book had come out at this time. And Clarence was, had brought a new guy down. And very often, uh, the wives went with him to all the meetings when it was Oxford. So he left the man to go through five days with Dr. Bob to get sobered up. And on the way back, he's commiserating with the man's wife that he's got these Catholic guys and he can't keep bringing them down there. So he, he'd like to start a separate meeting from Oxford so that the priest would give him a hard time. But he had no place to hold the meeting. And the wife is thinking, gee, if I volunteer my home, my husband will have no excuse for not going to the meeting because it'll be in his own house. So she volunteers her house to Clarence, and they started the meeting, and um, Dr. Baum and some of the other Oxford people came up and tried to stop it. But the meeting went ahead, and since the big book had come out, they called that meeting Alcoholics Anonymous, Cleveland Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. <clears throat> and later on, Clarence noticed that he was the first one to start a meeting with the name Alcoholics Anonymous, so he, not being very shy, <laughs> went around telling reporters that he started AA. <laughs> C'est la vie. 
Okay, who was the all-star catcher from the Cleveland Indians? Raleigh Helmsley. Somebody gave me a baseball card of Raleigh Helmsley. I think it's a great souvenir. <clears throat> he caught Bob Feller, if anybody remembers this, one of the first 100-mile-an-hour pitchers. And he was a great baseball player, but his drinking caused all kinds of trouble. As a matter of fact, reporters would follow Raleigh when he went out at night because he knew he was going to get in trouble and they knew they'd have a great story because he was going to do something that was worth reporting. Uh, once while the team was traveling on a train, he went around and collected all the newspapers he could find, put them in an upper bunk, set it on fire, and went back to his room. So these were the type of things he did. And um, the manager heard that the Oxford group had sobered up some alcoholics, and this was valuable property. <clears throat> so they went to the manager, I mean, he went to the Oxford people in Cleveland and said, how much to sober this guy up? And they said, well, it's, it's free. We don't charge anything. But he'll have to go to the hospital in Akron for five days. And the manager said, he, he won't go to hospitals. There's no way we can talk him into that. Well, unless he goes, um, we're not going to be able to do it. So they had one of their pitchers hit him during batting practice <laughs> with a pitch. And then the trainer ran out and said, oh, God, Raleigh, you're going to have to go to the hospital. This is really serious. And they ran him off, and he never drank again. And he ended up in, uh, I wish I had known this, he ended up right outside of Washington, D.C., well after I got sober. I could have gone over and met him, I didn't, but I wasn't familiar with history then. And he gave a talk in the Cosmopolitan Group, which was one of the first black groups in AA. And I got a copy of the talk, and it's really funny because he was AA number 78. That's pretty senior. And uh, so someone passed this along to the leader of the group who introduced the talk. He said, this is AA number 78. And the leader said, well, I'm about to introduce AA number 78. We don't use numbers in our group. <laughs> Having no idea. <laughs> this was really AA number 78. <laughs> And he gave a wonderful talk. Now, the reason, and this comes out a little bit later in another question, the reason he was important was once he got sober, the reporters had no one to follow. All the excitement was gone, and his batting average would way up. He wasn't making any errors, and they wanted to know how this was possible. And so in a press conference, he announced that it's possible because I joined Alcoholics Anonymous. And this got picked up by, the, by all the papers around the country. All-star catcher joins AA. Batting average goes up. <laughs> He's an all-star again. It's a big plug for AA, even though it was an anonymity break. And I think it got as many... <clears throat> inquiries at the Liberty Magazine article. So sometimes there's unintended consequences to screwing up. Okay, who was Ruth Houck and what role did she play in AA history? Bill's secretary? Huh? She typed the big book? Absolutely. When Bill, when he got um, Hank Parkhurst sober, who was one of the early AAs in New York, 
Hank, yeah, he had, um, Hank wrote the chapter to the employer in our big book. And it mentions in there that he was employed in a large corporation that had 3,500 people. I think it's 3,500 working for him. And then he got fired by Standard Oil. And he got a little resentment about that with his drinking and everything. So he started a little co-op in New Jersey. I think it was Honor Dealers or something like that. And Ruth Hauck he hired as his secretary. And he was going to get gasoline stations and distributors in his area and form a co-op where they'd be able to buy at discounts and eventually get even with Standard Oil. Yeah, sure. So he hired Bill. He said, Bill, you don't have a job. Come on over and the two of us. We're great salesmen. We're going to corner the market. And Ruth Houck said that she was hired over there. Nobody sold anything. And uh, that they just kept bringing drugs in. And they'd be in the back sobering them up. And then they decided to write the big book. And Bill would stand over dictating to her and she um, sometimes they didn't have enough money to pay her so they'd give her stock certificates in works publishing which had not yet been incorporated here Ruthie here's 25 shares of stock for your thing well anyway Unfortunately, Hank got drunk. He fell in love with her and wanted to leave his wife and all this. And when she turned him down, he just lost it. Got a big resentment. He thought Bill talked her into not marrying him. And went up to Cleveland and started really bad-mouthing what was going on in New York, that Bill was going to make a fortune off the big book and Money was being stolen and all this. And um, he and Clarence Snyder created such a stir up there that the uh, Cleveland contingent demanded that they bring the records up. That's not an easy thing to handle if you're Bill Wilson. And he brought the records up. And after everybody examined them, they saw that they were broke. <laughs> Nobody was stealing anything. And they actually apologized. While we're on that, once the the stock shares were divided between Bill and Hank and the members that bought them, <clears throat> and once the book caught on and they saw that AA was really going to be a significant success, they wanted to get the stock certificate back so that the fellowship could own them. We would own our own book. And most of the members were glad to give it back, but they got paid for it. But Hank didn't want to give his back. And if he didn't give him back, we I don't know where it would be in terms of our book. But he came into the New York office on a tear complaining about something and uh, he looked at the furniture and it was his furniture from the oil company over in Philadelphia he said you stole my damn furniture and Bill said well if you give me the stock certificates I'll give you your furniture back and 200 bucks and he took it and that's how he got ownership of our big book all right during the period 1939 to 1941 a major effort was made by AA <clears throat> boy my voice is gone you you guys are lucky to secure publicity for AA and the big book some of these occurred on their own it's just what were the these major publicity that occurred between 1939 and 1941. 
the Cleveland Plain Dealer. That's the newspaper in Cleveland. Yes. Jack Alexander, Saturday Evening Post. Gabriel Heater on the radio. Rockefeller Dinner. The postcards were connected to Gabriel Heater. That was where they were announcing it. There was this one Irish guy, Ryan, who knew Heater. And Heater was a famous radio broadcaster. And um, in his little show, he would have a two or three minute interview with somebody. And Ryan was able to get him to book him. But Ryan kept getting drunk. And Bill was a little worried that he wouldn't show up for the radio show. So they put him in the YMCA in New York City with AA guard around the clock until the radio show took place. And they sent out the last $500 was postcards to all the doctors east of the Rocky Mountains telling them about this new fellowship. Tune in to the Gabriel Heater show. Hear all about how to sober up your alcoholic patients and get the book Alcoholics Anonymous. And when they went down to the post office box, I think they had seven postcards. A couple of them were from drunk doctors, so they couldn't read (laughs) what was on them. And I think they got two orders for the book Alcoholics Anonymous, and things weren't looking good. Saturday Evening Post, I think most people know that, that the original mission was to go over and get the straight scoop on AA. That obviously, they were pulling the wool over the public's eyes with all this good stuff. Oh, they're helping people. It's free. So Jack Alexander would like to do exposés. And so he came over to investigate AA. And when he got through, he became one of AA's biggest friends and biggest supporters. And um, the article that he wrote brought in thousands of requests to join AA. Cleveland Plain Dealer was Clarence Snyder again. There's a book called How It Worked. It's out of print, but if you can get a copy of it, it's just about Clarence. Now, granted, it's from his point of view, but what a character. He has to be one of AA's greatest characters. And Ruth Houck said that if he had been more um, hospitable or more in harmony with Bill and Dr. Bob, then we might have had three co-founders because he was the champion 12-stepper. His energy started the first intergroup, wrote the first pamphlets up in Cleveland, how to do jail meetings, how to do hospital meetings. I mean, it was just... His vision was that there would be centers around the country that would do their own thing, and there wouldn't be this one center in New York calling all the shots. Sometimes I agree with him. Um, Raleigh Helmsley gave his Saturday Evening Post and the Rockefeller Dinner. Probably the Rockefeller Dinner should go down in history as the single event to remove the stigma of being an alcoholic because here's this man inviting all of his friends, bakers or whatever in New York 
and having it appear in the newspapers all over. John D. Rockefeller has a formal dinner for drunks. And some of the reporters made fun of it. But in general, it gave legitimacy to Alcoholics Anonymous. And that is something to be very, very grateful for. And he never took his eye off of AA. And a lot of the people that were on his staff became trustees in our early fellowship. So there's a great deal that uh, came about as a result of Bill complaining to his brother-in-law, who happened to know Rockefeller's personal secretary and set up the meeting. Who was AA number three? Bill Dotson. Does he have any other thing that we should mention? Man, yes, a lawyer. <laughs> the man on the bed. Who said that? Good answer. You know our picture, the man on the bed? That's the who is being portrayed there. Is everybody familiar with the man on the bed, the picture? Okay. You can get it from New York. When did the practice of giving out chips originate? Sister Ignatia. Boy, we got sharp people here today. Sister Ignatia would give, when they finished the treatment with Dr. Bob, and she was a pretty stern little gal. And she would call each drunk in and give them a sacred heart medallion and tell them if they're going to drink, they have to bring it back to her. <laughs> and uh, they think a lot of people stayed sober rather than go back and... <laughs> and face Sister Ignatia. And from that it went on. There were some silver dollars that were common in different parts of the country. And they would drill a hole in it. A guy over at uh, St. Pete, good friend of mine, on my anniversary gave me his with 50, I mean with 48 holes in it. It's just a, quite a nice thing for somebody to give you. And of course they don't um, it's not the same all over the country. The, the white chip is but the rest of them depends on where you go whether the blue one is this or the red one is that or now we got boxes with two and a half months and all kinds of things. <laughs> Would anybody like to have three months? Come on up, we got one. <laughs> what was moral rearmament? It, it evolved out of the Oxford group um, and became huge. This uh, thing that Buckman got started, it uh, they had one in um, Washington, D.C., and it looked like the who's who of America was there to continue with this, we can save the world by saving individuals morally. That if we transform individuals, we can transform countries. And, uh, of course, AA is certainly based on the transformation of individuals producing a society such as the one we're describing. It is the transformation of individuals. Why was anonymity originally adopted? I didn't hear that. Fear. fear. Okay, fear of being overpowered by all the alcoholics that would want to join. It was an unjustified fear. <laughs> Once 
the drunks in my neighborhood find out that I'm sober and willing to help them, there'll be a thousand of them at my doorstep. So I've got to stay anonymous for control purposes. And so we got our anonymity on really a kind of a wrong basis. And boy, look at it. It's, it occupies two of our traditions and became um, just such a powerful part of our program. Anonymity is almost synonymous with humility. Getting, if I'm anonymous, then I'm nothing. You know, I'm just Richard, an alcoholic. And you go, that's not much of an identity. I'm Richard, an alcoholic. That's like saying I'm John, just a child of God. Sort of a throwaway line. You couldn't have a better identity. And it was achieved by getting rid of your resume, which is most of us our identity. Who are you? Here's my resume. Whoa. That's impressive. Went to Harvard, yeah, PhD, worked over here. You know Senator Jones? Wow, this is really impressive, impressive. Yeah, it is. A lot of people tell me that. It's very impressive. And then we come in here and we go, who are you? I'm Joe, an alcoholic. That's a much more powerful identity than any resume. And when we come up against that anonymity and humility, we can relook at our resume and say, this is the talents that I have that might help your corporation, and this is the stuff that I could be useful at, and I'd be glad to come over and work for you. It's not demanding anything other than the opportunity to use these God-given talents in the best way possible. So you see, uh, just by taking anonymity and humility and applying it to a resume, you can transform that document into something that has no ego in it, which is really amazing. <laughs> so history... If you're not interested in it, I really think it's something you should put on your list to consider. Um, Kurtz, I've been, I've been just digesting his footnotes and digesting, and he just keeps emphasizing what AA is. What are the essential principles? And the more I read him, the more I realized that our preamble is way out of whack. We exchange our experience, weakness, and hope. We exchange our powerlessness. We don't have any strength. It comes from God. And um, it just... We are very limited. When we go on a 12-step call, we, we tell them how screwed up I am so that you can listen to me. We don't tell them how successful I am. Hey, come join AA. You can be the president of a corporation like I am. And I do this and I do that. So it's really we exchange our limitation as a human being so that the next person feels comfortable admitting that they may have some limitations. It's the first time they're comfortable admitting they aren't perfect. It's a, it's a strange thing. And granted, from our surrender, we have access to strength or power, but it doesn't come from inside of us. And so it's just, I like to get one on grapevine editors. 
which is where that came from. But it's funny, I'm, you know, I've been around a long time, I never saw that. It never dawned on me that there is no strength. Um, the reason I brought up history in this part, which is the second part, It's almost as if all the unanswered questions in your mind about our society can be found by studying our history, where the same problem may have been addressed 25 years ago, and you'll be able to look at a solution. It is... Um, I'll give you an example. It's accidentally, one of our little discussion meetings turned into a history meeting. And uh, it's a very simple thing to do. You just have people volunteer. They raise their hand. Okay, next Tuesday we need a volunteer. Tuesday after that, Tuesday after that. And whoever volunteered goes and researches some topic. They could have three months sobriety, and they're out there researching the Internet's filled with, we got a lot of history sites, etc. Then they come back next week and they give a little 15-minute present, presentation. Somebody came in with a Rockefeller dinner and they had the menu. And um, they just go and, and give this little presentation and sometimes they have some handouts, pass it around. And then it's open for sharing and a lot of the new people don't really have something, but the old-timers there can fill in and it starts developing this um, interest in history. And so I just pass it out as a suggestion because it just happened by accident. And it's very interesting to watch people. Now, one other thing, and Bob was talking about it, there's a whole website devoted to destroying AA. What's it called? Orange? A period orange is what I meant by memory. Yeah, A period orange. This guy's been around for years. And it's designed to um, just make it look like the worst organization and we're up to no good and don't trust us and we're liars. And I don't know who would spend that much energy hating AA. But there was a comedian, like, um, geez, I can't think of his name. And he had a line that said, no one liked me in high school because I was so popular. And maybe that's his problem, is that when you mention AA almost anywhere, you get a favorable feedback about our society. And... That can be irritating to people. You know, nothing but good news. And so I think people go out of their way to try and find something wrong. The first one I remember, we're almost out of time, was um, some psychologist wrote AA Culture Cure and came up with this whole thing that it was a big cult and it didn't really do what it said it did. We have found a way to um, cure alcoholics psychologically and they had these uh, experiments that they did and adverse reaction or whatever. And they had alcoholics sober for five years and did very careful studies. And some other psychologists about five years later did a study on it. And they found out that the results on how the alcoholics were doing was done by calling the alcoholic and asking him how he was doing. <laughs> and some of them were dead and they were still being carried as doing well and all that. And so there, there's that aspect, but in 
And the other thing I'll put in before we wrap it up, and I'll talk more tomorrow, is that AA as a society is in a bigger society. And the bigger society is not the same as it was when I came in. It's very different in terms of um, acceptance of religion, of spirituality, and so on down. Because AA was actually founded right around when Charles Darwin's ideas were being grabbed and scientists were starting to be the ultimate word on what this, what the universe is all about whereas religion had been in the past and in just the time I've been in it's almost as if science is the new religion it is it holds the answers to everything about the universe and who you are and all the questions. So alcoholics coming into AA today are being influenced in a way that wasn't there when I came in. This is just a whole different thing. So when they come in and want the prayers stopped and the, all that, they have a bigger motive than anybody did in the 60s. And it's because of the peer pressure that many of them feel. The universities are just, they're just, that is the religion of the university. So when someone comes into AA from that environment, I've, I've had one gal from Harvard tell me that if her classmates found out she had anything to do with God, they wouldn't talk to her. Now that's a lot more pressure than I remember. There wasn't anything like that pressuring me. I was the one who didn't want to hear anything. But it was just that it wasn't convenient to me to hear anything. I didn't want, you know, my sponsor said, forget about the Lord's Prayer. Eventually you're going to love it. And about five years later, I loved it. I could hardly wait for the meeting to end and be part of that. It was just wonderful. And I think back, what if my sponsor said, oh, well, then we won't say it. Just look what I would have lost. But I didn't have the social background to feel that it was necessary to push for this. So you can see, not only is our society subject to change, but the, uh, the society that we're in is entirely different. We have consumed an hour, and I can't think of anything else to add to this part. And so I'm going to say that when we finish this, so if you want to say a word, say it now. <laughs> Any word at all. I want to say just a couple of things if you've never experienced silence. You pick up any spiritual book and it'll tell you that silence is the language that God speaks. That that's where God lives. And that the more we can become comfortable with the silence, the more we can listen to what's going on in the silence. Feel free to smile at people. And if you're at dinner and you want to pat somebody on the back and whatever, it's we can communicate with smiles or we can just stare at our dinner. It doesn't matter either way. But if you've never done it before, I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised when the time is up and you realize that you may have learned more in this three plus hours than you've learned in the last couple months. There's a surprise waiting for you in there. So don't feel apprehensive or anything. So let's just start the silence. And I like this 
sign behind me, simply allow everything to be as it is. It's a wonderful thing to reflect on. And from this moment until we meet out there at quarter after eight or in here, that's it. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.